Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Uh, this Wednesday night, we're going to be discussing something I think is very near and dear to many a heart. Uh, if it's not, uh, I encourage you to look more deeper into the subject. We're going to be talking about not I, but Christ, uh, Galatians 2.20. Uh, Christ lives in me. I live, but it's not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. It's the uh, many refer to that as the exchanged life. Uh, some call it the deeper life. Some call it the victorious Christian life. Some call it the abundant Christian life. Uh, I kind of see where the the Holy Spirit just calls it life. The question is, does that phrase "not I but Christ" does that is that does that describe a sort of a over and beyond the normal Christian experience, some heightened uh, Christian experience that, that's only experienced by a select few? Or is that a life that refers to every single believer in the body of Christ? I'm going to go ahead and read the verses uh, of uh, reference here. Uh, this is in the second chapter of Galatians. Galatians, let's, let's begin at verse 19. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which otherwise we would have no access giving you all the glory and the honor and the praise. Teach us, dear Lord. Filter out all of that which is foolish. Seal to our hearts only that which is truth, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Verse 19 of chapter 2 in Galatians says, For I, and I want to read from the Greek, for I, through the law, and you can scratch the, the the is not there. I, through law, am dead to law. Law, the reason it's not the law here is because it's not articulated because law, it just says law. That is, in, the Holy Spirit is is really trying to push the point that this is any given standard whereby righteousness might be achieved on the human level. I, through law, that is, and, and I've pointed out many times in past videos how the church was never given the law. So the text has to be talking about, the Holy Spirit has to be really teaching us here that it is through law, that is law keeping, the flesh, I through the law, died to the law. Now, quite simply, law has no place in the believer's life. It serves no purpose other than to really drive us to Christ. Because it drives us to the end of ourselves, where that Christ is our life, which is really what the context is that we're talking about right here. I, through law, am dead to law in order that, there's a henna clause, in order that I might live unto God. Might, says your authorized version. In the Greek there, the word that I might live unto God, that is an aorist, active, subjunctive. The subjunctive is the mood of uncertainty. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Paul, Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, I, through law, am dead to law, in order that I might 
live unto God. It begs the question here is, I mean, should we be talking about that all of us having died to the law or just some of us having died to the law? Uh, when we're, we're getting ready to look at frustrating the grace of God, I mean, are, there, are, are we to separate Christians into two classes where that there are those who frustrate the grace of God? The word frustrate basically in the original text means to set it aside, make it null and void, of no effect, disregard, okay? That's frustrate God's grace. We set aside God's grace. Now, we've, we've seen in previous studies that we can receive the grace of God in vain, and I went so far as to point out to you folks how, that I believe that m much of Christianity today falls into that category. I have never been a big fan of putting Christians into different categories, and that, it, and that shouldn't be done when it comes to the hard facts of the matter, the truth that God has revealed concerning us, who we are, and what He's done in our lives. Uh, you've been forgiven, I've been forgiven. If I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, so have you. All, if you've died with Christ, so have I. Okay, we can't separate and put those groups into categories. We can't do that. But the text is talking about something with, that is in the mood of uncertainty here. I, through law, am dead to law, have died to law. That is a fact. That's not open for debate. That's not, well, maybe, ha, you know, well, Steve, you know, uh, have I died to the law or have I not died to the law? That's one of those things that's true of every one of us. We have died to law, to law, to any given standard whereby righteousness might be achieved on the human level. But have we all frustrated the grace of God? We're going to look at how Paul uses the present tense in saying that I do not presently, actively frustrate the grace of God. That also begs the question, well, is there, can there be at some point in Paul's life, can Paul come to a point in his life to where that he no longer not frustrates the grace of God? Is it possible that Paul could in the future frustrate the grace of God? The Holy Spirit, not Paul, he just merely held the pen here. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write what was true. I do not actively in the present, at the present time, I do not, a present active indicative, I do not, I definitely do not at the present time frustrate the grace of God. That's what our text is saying. Now I'm going to be reading from the Greek in verse 20 of chapter 2 here. Christ. It starts out with Christ. I have been crucified with. That's a perfect tense. I have with certainty. It's an indicative mood. I have definitely been crucified with Christ. Just stop and let's just ask ourselves a simple question. Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, I've been crucified with Christ. Is that just Paul? I think most of you would agree that that application extends itself toward us, every member of the body of Christ. We were crucified with Him, identified with Him in His death, burial, and resurrection. When He died, we died. He died for sin. He was made to be sin on our behalf in order that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And that righteousness, I believe, is connected to the word live in, the, in this verse, which we, I, will appear four times in the original text. I'm not sure about the authorized version. But in the original text, the word zoe, life, appears four times, and it denotes, zoe denotes the quality of life, not the not the duration of it, the extension of it, the, uh, it's not speaking of, well, we're going to live forever. That's, that's not the idea of the word life here. Zoe is the quality of life. So we've got Christ mentioned. We just previously looked at the fact that we died to law. That's any given standard whereby righteousness might be achieved 
uh, on the human level. That's not how we live. The text is going to go on and say we're in flesh, not in notice that it is in the you Greek folks out there who, who look at this stuff in the Greek. Notice it's not articulated. It's not in the flesh. We don't walk according to the flesh, but we live in flesh. We live in flesh. You're looking at flesh. I'm flesh. Okay, you're flesh. And that is what the word is speaking of in verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Okay. I live, says the text, I live. Well, of course you live because you've been identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. But no longer, you've got a conjunctive, conjunction there, but no no longer I lives. And again, the word is zoe. Okay? It is, uh, well, it's a present active indicative. I don't presently, I, I no longer presently live. Now, we'd have, it'd be foolish to suggest that, that that's connected to living in the sense of me breathing. Okay? Because I'm, I'm, I certainly live. But Paul says, I no longer live. However, again, you, we have a conjunction, but in me, in me, that is in my flesh, okay, Christ. Christ lives in me. That which then now I live, again, it's Zoe, in flesh, through faith. And how, how often have you heard me say, I believe it's the most important thing that we could possibly pursue in our lives as Christians. It is the greatest thing, I believe, that He desires. That's what Christ desires the most, is that we trust Him. We see that in the Old Testament with the, God testing the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. We live in faith, says the text. It is in faith. It's not through faith. That, that, that word through would be dia. It's epsilon nu. It's in faith that I live that quality of life. And that from the Son of God is what the text says. Not, that's not of ourselves. Okay? The one having loved me having loved me, okay, and having given up himself for me. Now, in looking at verse 21, my text says, I do not, not, it starts out not, not, do I, set aside the grace of God. Set aside is the word uh, that's 114 uh, in the Greek, Strong's 114 Greek word. The word uh, 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 is uh, denotes, of, uh, I, I believe your authorized version is going to say frustrate. King James Version, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not set it aside. I do not annul it. I do not make it void. I do not make it of no effect. I do not dis... Dis disrespect it, dishonor it. Um, there's a lot of uh, uses of that word uh, throughout the New Testament. I do not frustrate the grace of God, says Paul. And that is a uh, present active indicative. He presently, he's saying, I presently do not. Now, he's not saying, and he wouldn't say, of course, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I don't believe. I, d I do not believe. At least the temptation is there for me to not believe that, well, it's, it's, well, what Paul is saying here in, in the Holy Spirit using the present tense, I do not presently, actively, definitely, uh, that's the indicative mood, I do not frustrate the grace of God. But, well, we can ask ourselves a few questions here. I mean, is that the ideal, the perfect ideal that the Holy Spirit is trying to present? Or is that something that's true of every one of us? Do, do, are there two classifications of Christians, those who frustrate the grace of God and those who do not? That's the question. And should we divide Christians into two groups, two classifications? 
The context here is, is law and grace. Uh, where the law it has no place in the believer's life, we don't, we're not under law, we live in grace, we, we have a life that is, uh, man, Christ is manifest in and through our lives by faith, not by law. Notice, notice how odd it would say that, well, we do not frustrate the law of God. Well, I mean, you, so you could argue, well, I mean, if that's what the text said, well, now we're under law and it's, you know, we're looking at, a, at frustrating the law of God. God gave us the law. We didn't keep it. We failed in keeping it. And so we frustrated the law of God. Folks, how can we frustrate the grace of God is my question. Now, the argument I'm sure it can go and, and I'm, and I'm sort of, I have, to, I, I won't, I don't mind admitting here, I'm still wondering about a few things here myself. I mean, are there two different types of Christians? Those who frustrate the grace of God and those who do not. It, or is that, or we, could we say that the new man, the sinless new man, it never frustrates the grace of God. And, and if we ever come to frustrate the, the grace of God, that's the old man. So is Paul talking about his new man here? I do not frustrate the grace of God. Or is he talking about that mysterious third person I've mentioned from time to time, which just happens to be us because we are in a new creation in possession of a both an old and new man. So, so we have a response toward God. We're not trying to change the old man. We're not trying to clean up the old man. And we're, we're certainly not trying to improve upon something that can't be improved upon, which is the new sinless new man but what is it we're going to do are we going to frustrate the grace of god or are we not for through law and again it's not articulated through law any given standard whereby righteousness might be achieved on the human level through law then uh, for through the law righteousness is then actually the Greek is a little tough to to follow if you're because the God uses certain he'll put words up front for emphasis just like it's you know not okay not I do it, do, it doesn't read like the English not I do set aside the grace of God if for through the law righteousness righteousness is in other words, if righteousness come through the law, and, and we got to stop and we got to remind ourselves that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Folks, we have no righteousness in and of ourselves. It's the righteousness of God that's based upon faith. If you followed us through Romans, if that were the case, if righteousness came through the, through the law, in which, in which case Christ was the fulfillment of the law, then Christ died for naught, for nothing. As like, you know, not, you know, zero. He died for nothing. I'm going to make a suggestion. Some of you may like it, some of you may not, but we're going to wrap this up with just a few further thoughts of my own. Um, and uh, and we'll see just kind of at least you at least you'll see from our standpoint here at BHF where we stand on Galatians verses nine, chapter two verses nineteen through twenty one. Folks, the gulf that exists between I shall be as God, and not I but Christ, is is as wide as the expanse between heaven and hell. And even Christians can be caught in the snare of the devil. You know, I shall be as God. That's what the flesh does. Even though ye are complete in Him, Colossians 2.10. We are complete in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 states, For who makes you any different, and what do you have that you did not receive? And if also you did receive it, well, why do you boast 
as not having received it. We don't separate Christians into different classes when it comes to what God has done in their life. The same is true of all of us. The Holy Spirit doesn't divide Christians into two groups as far as what we've all received, which is His grace, His blessings, we even His peace. He gave that to you. Joy, His joy, rest. But the text is clear in that, and I'm talking about verse 19, we may or may not live unto God. Might, the word might is in the subjunctive mood of uncertainty. Maybe we will live unto God, maybe we won't. We can't get around the, the grammar here. Aorist, active, subjunctive. Now the aorist tense sees the action as a whole. It looks at your whole life here. It's not a back and forth event, a, a double-minded, unstable attitude toward grace or, or an attitude toward law. The text seems to infer that it is a place that we come to in our stage of spiritual development, our growth, or not, which I believe is consistent with the Word of God. Different stages of spiritual development or growth is a very real concept in the Word of God. It's a very real thing that should not be looked upon as separating Christians into, well, you got your good Christians, you got your bad Christians, you got your really bad Christians, you got your really super Christians. Folks, I would not call a one inch tomato plant worse than a 12 inch tomato plant. Okay, they, they both have the same value. They're both living, they're both growing plants. However, the growth can be stunted we are said to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not I, but Christ is, I believe, an expression that the Holy Spirit uses to describe how that we live in Christ who is our life. It must be agreed that Christ lives in us, in every child of God. That's, we know that that's true. I don't think there'd be much argument there. Even in those who frustrate or who set aside the grace of God. But it doesn't mean, what it, here's what it does not mean. It doesn't mean that they haven't received the grace of God because they have. But their experience, well, it can kind of go something, I, I don't know, Something kind of like this here, okay? I mean, I've never been known for my illustrations, but let, let's suppose that someone, okay, gave you a horse for your birthday. Someone gives you a horse for your birthday. And, and you insisted on paying for the present. Well, Steve, I don't want you giving that to me. You know, I, I owe you something for that. The gift of that horse. I think that it would frustrate the giver. I think the horse would nevertheless be yours. But how, how would you ever experience the quality of life, okay, the quality of life for which the gift of grace that was given you was intended? Thanks for listening. We'll see you Sunday. Please join us for our study through 2 Corinthians. We're in chapter 10, uh, looking at that verse by verse. Until then, dearly beloved, rest in Him. We love you all. We truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.